So good morning, Francois. Uh, I am delighted to welcome you uh, to my interview show. How are you today? I'm good. I'm very good. So um, Francois Candelon is um, is um, senior partner at um, Boston Consulting Group, and um, he is also has been nominated as top fifty um, um, uh, thinkers uh, very recently. Um, so congratulations. Um, would you like to tell us more about yourself? Introduce yourself. Yeah, so I'm, uh, let's say I'm a BCG veteran or a BCG baby because I joined BCG just after I've been graduated from uh, uh, my engineering school in France, Ecole Polytechnique. And, and then uh, I've been spending now uh, so 28 years at BCG. But what I loved at BCG is the opportunity to reinvent yourself. So I've been uh, working almost exclusively in uh, TMT, uh, Technology, Media and Telecommunications. I, I led or um, telecom practice um, at some point. And then because at BCG, you always rotate every six years about what you do. Then in uh, 2012, I said, okay, uh, I want to move to China because you cannot understand the world without having a flavor of China. I'm just a flavor because uh, it would be a lifelong, uh, let's say, journey otherwise. And then in China, I've been working with uh, um, the most leading uh, tech companies. Um, and then I discovered AI and the impact that AI can have on uh, every industry. And this is why when I uh, was coming back from uh, China in, uh, at the end of 2019, nothing related to uh, COVID, um, I said, okay, now I really want to focus on AI because you cannot understand the world without having a flavor of AI. And this is why since uh, uh, early 2020, I'm really focusing on AI related topics and I have two roles. Um, I'm leading the BCG Henderson Institute, which is uh, BCG think tank, um, where I focus my research on the impact of AI on tech and society. I will come back to that. And I work with um, BCG Gamma, which is our AI arm or a data analytics arm. Um, and I am really trying to help and support uh, TMT companies really move into this front and really revisit the way they uh, they uh, they work with AI. And, and I think that this is what I like um, at BCG in general, at BCG Henderson Institute in particular, the fact that we mix both this academic perspective and uh, I'm working with many, uh, let's say, uh, academic scholars. I'm uh, publishing in many reviews and this practitioner perspective. I, I think it's uh, it's win-win and it enriches, um, let's say one enriches the other. Indeed, you have been very prolific, um, uh, contributed to lots of, uh, um, and co-authored to lots of academic articles. So I have some of them here, so I will ask you about them in more details. But first, um, so um, why, uh, why Boston Consulting Group is interested in, in AI? Could you please so, explain us uh, in more uh, detail? I, I think because let's say the role of BCG is really to try to support its clients to embrace the world as it goes. And so you cannot one you cannot work uh, without AI. I, I remember one uh, journalist who asked me, "Okay, what can you do with AI?" And my answer was, "What cannot you do with AI?" And and therefore I think it's relevant. I think the the, the purpose of BCG is really to uh, our purpose is to unlock potential. Um, and of course, AI is at the core of what can be done uh, by companies. And, and this is why we want to be a leading edge on every topic that would be, uh, let's say, very critical for our clients uh, to, uh, to, to unlock their potential and, uh, and advance uh, tomorrow's world. Okay, great. So you have um, uh, recently written an article with um, Michael Jacobites and uh, Stefano Busc uh, Brusconi um, about um, looking from the evolutionary perspective on artificial intelligence. So perhaps um, first let's start, how do you define AI? Because the paper goes into it in great detail. Yeah, so I, I think that for us, what is important for companies is the fact that with AI, you have three, I would say, foundational capabilities. One is really about achieving ultra granularity. The second is really about uh, processing big data real time. And the third one is the ability to scale up massively at minimal marginal cost. Uh, 
And I think that with these foundational capabilities, you can have functional capabilities, pattern and, anima and uh, anomaly detection, prediction and recommendation, evaluation and simulation, optimization, human-like perception. And, and, and the way we, we define it is really by using AI, you can then revisit and totally revisit the way you think about your company. And um, uh, the, um, the, the something which is, which is important, and I'll always use this, uh, this question, is that then, based on that, how far do you want to go? With these companies, because for instance, if I take um, several companies, they say, "Okay, how can I use AI to improve my processes?" I believe they should reverse the version and say, "How do you need to revisit your processes to bring AI at the core of it?" Because as I said, when you can scale up at minimal zero marginal costs, when you can have really ultra granular forecasting. You can revisit the way you're doing, and and um, for instance, I've been working with during COVID with uh, with some um, some clients, and because of COVID and the fact that many of the things were really new, they they lost many of their data, or their data were not relevant anymore. So really, they were embracing the analysis of big data real time, and for a luxury good brand, uh, we were able to predict three weeks in advance, the products that would be sold and the combination of that. And at that time, if you are back to March 2020, three weeks were, let's say, uh, as long as eternity. And therefore, it helped us, it helped them know which, which uh, plants, which product they should push, they, they should uh, bring somewhere and so on. So I think that thanks to that, they were able to revisit the way to do it. Um, and they really, I have another example with an underwriting company that revisited its entire um, its, its entire process to really think about underwriting. And, and I think that these are the things that are getting revisited. And we're at a turning point, I would say, in um, with AI and with companies. Some of them still want to stay and to improve little by little. Others are really embracing uh, AI and its full potential. And for this, that ones, in my opinion, they are more likely to be the winners, tomorrow's winners. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, thank you. You also in your article make interesting um, distinction um, between um, narrow and general um, artificial intelligence. Can you please uh, explain it to us in more detail? No, I, and, I, and I think that many people think about or are afraid about general intelligence. AI, general AI, I think it's an interesting question, but we should let it at the moment, put it on the side because it's not something that will happen tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So I think that at the moment, what is really critical is to look at narrow AI. So basically you have use cases and it's based on what I just said as a foundational, uh, foundational capabilities. And by doing this, but it can drastically change the way companies work, mm -hmm. um, change the output, change, let's say, uh, even how societies, what the impact on our society. And uh, we can see that uh, cybersecurity is becoming something extremely important. With AI today, with narrow AI, you can already have impact on elections and so on. And I, I was discussing the other day with, uh, uh, during a panel at the uh, United Nations, um, with a Russian, was very strong and was telling me you we used to think about general about ai as a, a gpt a, a, a general uh, uh, public technology uh, public technology and what i can see and he was saying but now we need to think much more about it as a as a nuclear weapon uh, in a sense that uh, every so companies but countries as well will try to benefit from it. And, and it will have massive implications on, uh, um, on um, regulation. Uh, we can see the emergence of different regulation, but I would add to add the NES because very often people were saying, okay, AI requires regulation. That's true. 
we all know this question about fairness, transparency, and so on. So responsible AI is important and probably we need regulation for that. But what we will see is much more regulations because the from a cultural perspective, what is acceptable in uh, Europe, uh, or I would say in China or in the US might not be in Europe. I, I should say it in this, uh, in a, let's say this way, because in Europe we are very uh, we are we are very careful about what we can do and uh, what is accepted. You can have a look at uh, the uh, the EU framework um, that was presented a few months uh, a couple a few months ago. But it's very important for us to keep that in mind and to see that uh, from a cultural perspective it's already coming. But now even from a competitive competitive perspective it's important. Um, and it's important for nations. For instance, um, uh, Michael Porter used to say that competitiveness of nations is made of innovation, the ability to innovate, and the ability to upgrade your companies. And, um, and, and I think that what we see at the moment is that the level of innovation where you have uh, the US leading in front of China, and then you have Europe, and then we have, let's say, many continents which are lagging behind like Latin America or uh, or Africa so it would be important but more importantly you have adoption and what is interesting to see the fact that there on adoption China is leading and and it is very important because basically the more you lead on adoption the more you create data relevant data the more you can let's say train your algorithms and therefore it has a retroactive impact on innovation so I think that the way uh, China leads on adoption might be very, uh, very interesting. And, and in this uh, article with Michael Jacobides and uh, uh, Stefano Brozzoni, we, we, we try to explain how, uh, let's say, different, different ways and different contexts in the US, in China or in Europe can lead to different levels of adoptions and lead to different animals. Yes, I would like to actually come to back to this uh, to this question of um, of regulation because this is very important and also the way how countries compete with each other in in, uh, in relation to um, AI. Um, and that's um, I would like to come back to it. But now uh, let's um, let's go back to um, just perhaps explain to those who do not know uh, or who are new to this term. So the narrow artificial intelligence, how would you define it? Or you have defined it in the article, but just for those who have not read the article. No, the, the, for me, the narrow artificial intelligence is really the use of um, is the use of algorithm that are trained by data and can and which can, based on this, can improve themselves. So I think that this is this notion of artificial intelligence. I would link it, link it now to really it's machine learning, it's deep learning. It's the fact that basically it won't change. Artificial intelligence does not think by itself, OK? It's not the question. What is important here is more the fact that it is improving by itself. You can give it the rules and it will learn. This is what we saw, for instance, with, the, with Go, the, the game of Go, um, and so on. So this is really the way it, you give them the rules and they are able, by practicing, they are able to, to, to improve and, and to learn. This is this notion of learning, which is important. But I think that we should not oppose AI and human. And I give you two, uh, two reasons why. Um, first of all, because um, we, every year we do, um, let's say, uh, we, we release a report that we uh, work on uh, with, uh, with our friends from MIT. And uh, I, uh, I would like to give them hell, to say them hello, because it's a really a joint work and it's great to have this type of cooperations. And, um, and then what we, we saw uh, last year is the fact that what makes uh, what is very important and what creates financial benefit is what we call organizational learning, or you could call it human plus AI, is, is the ability to understand how human and AI can work together. We were demonstrating that, and, and only in our survey last year and this year as well, only 11% of companies are able to do it. But it's not enough to have, uh, I would say, uh, 
to try to build AI with a strategy, with the data, with a, let's say a data lake and infrastructure, uh, with um, with some algos. No, with this you are unlikely around the twenty percent or twenty five percent chance likelihood to get strong financial benefit. It's not enough even to consume and produce AI, not just for optimization, for uh, let's say uh, cost reduction, but trying to use it to increase your revenues through personalization and so on. That's great and you can make progress, but you're just at around 40%. The real difference is when you have this human plus AI uh, mutual learning, which means that because we all know that AI is great at managing big data, as I mentioned, becoming ultra granular, but humans are much better with ambiguity. And if you are able to identify the roles, and I will come back to these roles, and you're able to apply them well, then you are much more likely to have financial benefits. We are at more than 75%, around 75% of companies doing that are able to get financial benefit, but not many of them are able to do it. And, and, and it is understandable because we live in a world which is extremely uncertain. And as we live into a, in an uncertain world, no doubt we are able in this uncertain world, the rate of learning is really critical. And if you work with AI, this is the best way to um, really move it to uh, the right level and to create these financial benefits. So if I'm back to the roles that we identify, ident we identify, let's say, uh, four key roles. AI, what we call AI illuminator. So basically, you want to work with AI, but to try to find new ideas. And I give you uh, one example, for instance, Ben and Jerry. Uh, they use a data lake. They said, OK, let's see what it comes with. And they identify that in many songs, people were eating ice creams during breakfast. And so it gave them the idea to create, let's say a breakfast ice cream, ice cream for breakfast. The second that we call is AI as a recommender. So the AI will recommend and humans will decide. And here I was the other day with, um, with the head of a trading floor uh, in a bank and he was telling me that was incredible how you can create what I would call a virtual circle uh, between human and AI, traders and AI. So basically upfront, let's say AI will learn from humans and from traders because they will look at the data they consider to make the decision, to take the decisions and so on. So it's AI learned from humans. Then AI will gather millions of decisions and then will be able to, uh, to do it more specifically and to learn and then make its recommendation. But then humans, can learn from AI. Because when they learn from AI, why? Because AI will come with new paths, new ideas. And because of that, you may, tra traders will say, oh, yes, but that's a good idea. Maybe I should try. And when they try, they learn new way, they take new decisions, and you can start again. Once more, an AI can learn from, uh, from traders. So, so this is a recommender. Then you have the deciders. Um, for instance, uh, uh, where human decides and, uh, sorry, uh, AI decides and human implement. And I don't know if you're aware of Domino's Pizza's uh, pizza checker. Yes. Uh, basically, they have um, um, an AI that will see whether the pizzas are good, the topping are made well or not. And if they believe it's not good, then it's back to the human and the human changes because it changes it. And in one month, they checked more than 13 million, 13 million pizzas, and it improved the uh, the reviews by 15 points, one five. It's huge. It's huge. Uh, the last one is what we call the automator. Uh, basically, if you take uh, Rio Tinto and uh, its mining in Pilbara, it's an autonomous. Um, it's an autonomous um, uh, mine where you have hundreds of. Uh, autonomous vehicles with uh, sensors and so on, and they are able to decide what they need to mine where, and it has massive impact. So it's supervised 1,000 one, 1, miles away in Perth, and, um, but basically decisions are taken by the autonomous intelligence, the artificial intelligence that are there with many benefits 
uh, that you can imagine. So it's 24 seven, it can go to hazardous areas where you would not send humans and so on. So uh, many new roles that you can uh, work with and what is good and uh, will be released in, um, in uh, next year, in next month's uh, report um, is basically uh, the fact that humans and company, humans in companies that work well with AI, teams are happier, they find that the decisions are better um, and, and, and they collaborate more. Uh, so it's not at the expense of, it's really about human and AI. Thank you. That's actually a very good explanation of it. So how could, for example, AI be used? Um, how do you think it could be used in the strategy formulation process, for example, for companies? So in the strategic uh, formulation process, I, I think that you need to, of course, you can use it for scenarios because you can have plenty of scenarios. You can do uh, many things there. You can uh, predict, you can review uh, options. You can uh, identify anomalies. You can detect anomalies and anomalies are very important to define, um, uh, to define um, a, a strategy. But I think that what we need to do in the strategy, as I said, is to try to play with these three cards that I was mentioning, the ultra granularity, the real time uh, big data and the scale up at marginal cost, so that you rethink your strategy with this and you look at the, uh, the pain points that you have, that your customers have, and then say, okay, how could I revisit the way my business model? Uh, how could I innovate with my business model, with my uh, operating model to change this and to, to, to be much more proactive, uh, much better there. And uh, so I think that very upfront in your strategic process, uh, you need to think about it, but to think broad and to ask yourself, how can I revisit my strategy with the art of the possible with AI? And you have plenty of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, companies, I could mention Starbucks, which revisited the way of doing it. Instead of increasing beverage making efficiency, they went to, okay, how can I deliver beverage in the best conditions at the right time to the individual? And therefore they came to something which was truly personalized. Um, I can think about Repsol, for instance, which has launched more than uh, 200 AI related and digital uh, AI related projects over the last three years from, um, let's say, uh, from uh, exploration and production, and it helped them multiply by two the efficiency there, down to uh, creating personalized offers at every, uh, let's say, uh, in every shop. Uh, hundreds of thousands of personalized offers every day. Uh, and, and I think that it's really rethinking the art of possible with AI, which is um, very important. And, and, and using these examples with Starbucks and, uh, and uh, Repsol, I wanted to use these examples because very often people say, oh yes, but it is for, uh, um, for startups, it's for new companies. No, 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 no. Even I would say traditional companies in traditional industries can actually reinvent themselves. But it's very hard. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So if we have a time, we can uh, come back to this. How could the traditional companies reinvent themselves with AI? Because that would, of course, help them to survive. So that would be a good question to come back to if we have time. Um, I would like to now ask you about, um, so we have uh, talked just now about how AI can be used to, um, for strategy formulation. How about strategy implementation? But I think that for strategy implementation, it's everywhere because, and I think that it was even demonstrated with COVID even more. The fact that, as I said, we live in an uncertain world. So with AI, you can on one hand optimize and on the other, you can predict or forecast with more granularity. And you can, in a sense, what I say, reduce the um, unpredictable to what is truly unpredictable. So therefore, by, by using it and having these two things, you can optimize on one hand, you can predict on the other as much as you can. And of course, there are things that you cannot predict. We could not predict COVID. We could say, oh, it might happen, but you never know when. But it helps you react. So you can preempt, you can predict, you can optimize, you can react more quickly. 
And, and I think that with all of that, it's very important for everyone to have that in mind and to keep that and to leverage the full potential of AI. And, and I think this is one of the main difficulties we can see because in many companies, especially the traditional companies, the CXOs um, in the early 50s or whatever are not familiar with AI. But at the same time, they need to continue working and playing their role. And they, they, sh and, and they should play their role and they should try to push and understand what they can do with AI to make sure that the AI is considered as an opportunity and as a risk as well. Uh, we've seen it in several cases. I, can, I won't mention them here, but we're, because of uh, biases or because of decisions that were made, basically companies were really facing massive issues. So this is something that CXOs should be aware of. Something that would be wrong is to say, okay, I will delegate AI to someone else. They do what they do with it. It would be wrong for two reasons. The first one is that AI should be at the core of your operating model, at the core of your business model, one. And second is because it's, a, it's at the, as it is at the core of the company, as a CXO, you need to fully understand it and leverage it. Thank you. And um, how, how, how AI do you think would impact differently on middle managers and top managers? Or, how so I, I think that it, it impacts, so as I said, it impacts the, uh, the, uh, the CXO in the fact that they need to understand what they can, what the playing field they define, but making sure that if it goes out of this playing field, there, there is a, let's say, an escalation process. So they provide guidelines, they need to get feedback, they need to provide guidelines, they need to make sure that during the project or if there is a risk that uh, there is an escalation and they then need to monitor the progress of it because again as i said ai should be at the core of every company mm -hmm. so for the front line it will change their uh, their daily job I, I have one example for instance was with uh, dhl and um, they uh, they implemented ai to try to better organize the pallets in the uh, for in the aircrafts so to optimize, and, and, and we all know that the first day of AI is its worst day, uh, because then they will, AI will learn and improve. So I think that it was very important to have, and I, as I said, this human plus AI approach, because basically you need to think about how humans can work with it. And at DHL, they were doing that. And the first day, the, um, the employees were not fully convinced, but very quickly they saw that the company, the AI was making progress and that it was helping them as well improve in their job. So it needs to be win-win. And when it is win-win, um, it's much easier to get it accepted. And just one anecdote, um, which is, or one figure, is the fact that in companies where you have, you use AI, employees are not afraid of AI. While in companies where it's not the case, Basically, they are worried about AI. So it's very important as a country to educate people on AI. It's very important as a company to educate and to explain to employees what will happen. Then for the mid-management, I think it's a bit the same. It can be seen positively if it help them improve, um, but you, need, you definitely need to upskill them. And this is where, for instance, uh, coming back to the article you were mentioning with, um, with Michael Jabkobides and Stefano Bruzzoni and uh, a, a work I'm currently doing with Kai Fuli, uh, we identified that in China, you have some animal that we call transformers that are extremely interesting because basically they help traditional companies, trans let's say, leverage AI at its best. And they do that, very, basically these are companies, these transformers, so-called transformers, if you have a better name, I'm, I can take it, um, are companies that master AI and master a vertical uh, industry, okay? And then what do they bring to companies? They bring the fact that they, they help them get access to um, relevant, um, industry, relevant uh, algorithm 
they give them access to AI talents because for a traditional company, it's very difficult to get access to AI talents because when you are an AI talent, you want to go to a company that leverages AI, that leverages AI. So you won't go to a dinosaur. Um, so, but and at the same time, what they do, because they know the, the language of the industry, the vertical industry, they can help traditional companies upskill their people. And then the last thing that they help them redefine their business model and their operating model. Um, and it's very important because we used to say at uh, BCG uh, that when you look at the effort to transform for a traditional company, we're what we call 10, 20, 70. 10 is the effort you do for algorithm. It's not that difficult to have a decent algorithm, maybe not the best one, but to have one. 20 in terms of effort is about the, um, the, the, um, the, the infrastructure. Uh, infrastructure being both, let's say, the, 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 the DPP, the data platform, being data and the data quality, is, it's an effort. And then we have, but we say we have 70, which is more on the change management. And it's very important because very often our companies are siloed, but AI doesn't understand organizations and doesn't understand silos. And therefore it needs to go end to end. And, and, and this is why it's very difficult for companies to, um, to, to, to cut these silos and to accept it. The second thing is that even if you um, do it well, you have, uh, let's say it drastically changes the way companies make uh, make their business. And I'll give you one example, in telcos. In telcos, very often you have campaigns. So basically you are trying to push offers to certain segments and so on. Now with AI, you can offer the right, you can propose the right offer at the right time to an individual. So which means this is the end of campaigns. But we were doing this um, at, a, at a telco uh, in Asia and the, 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 the chief marketing officer didn't want to stop campaigns because he was saying, this is what I know. So I know if I can push a little bit more and so on. So we, 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 we piloted the, uh, let's say the, uh, this offer, personalized offer and the results were just great, but he was afraid because to a certain extent he was becoming obsolete. The other types of, and then it drastically changes the way marketers are working because marketers, instead of really trying to push offers to do, to automatize, all the rest is autonomized in a sense by AI. What you ask marketers is really to produce content to be much more creative. So you need to change AI with AI. You have a lot of issues to overwhelm, to, 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 uh, to, to, to go after because you're facing real issues um, because it changes the way humans do their job. And this is why it's very important to have what we call in our jargon, um, a strategic, strategic workforce planning. Strategic workforce planning, meaning that you need to understand the type of capabilities you need, and therefore, in the type of capabilities you don't need anymore. And then based on that, to be clear on the way, the type of capabilities you need to hire and the people you will upskill. And this is something that will be very important if we want to make sure that AI will be seen by companies and accepted in companies. Yes, it is actually, you have um, already preempted me. And the next question on my list is I wanted to ask you about implementing AI strategies, yes? And you have partially already answered it. Is there something else that you would like to add? No, I, I think that, as I said, the, um, the, 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 the key thing is about change management. Um, and it's about, let's say, how to make capabilities and, and people work together, uh, I would say. But... Maybe what I want to add is um, the fact of what I call the, the, the social license or how to create trust with AI, because creating trust with AI, AI is a technology, okay? It's not more, not less than that, but it's then what you do with it. But I think that there is what I call this notion of social license to operate AI in a company or at a, a country level, which is very important because AI can be very helpful, but 
there are questions about regulations or about companies that say, oh, the change management is too large, so I don't want to implement it. And then you are facing real issues uh, because we would under underuse AI. And, and to have this, what I call this social license, there are three big parts. One is really responsible AI, the traditional responsible AI, fairness, transparency, how to go more with that and how to make sure that we bring it to the next level. And it's not that easy because there is no black and white. Uh, so it's, it's a gray area, but you need to make sure that you implement responsible AI. But there are some other elements. What I call, let's say, the, um, the, uh, the, the you, you need to clarify the real benefit, the, the benefit risk. For instance, when you go to, to an hospital or you are happy to share your, uh, your data, if you believe that it will increase, that it will increase the, uh, the, the, the quality of the diagnostic. But it can be seen differently depending on, um, on countries. For instance, I was, as I told you, I, was, uh, I spent, uh, let's say, almost the last decade in, uh, in China. And for instance, I can tell you that they welcome AI much more than we do because when you are in Western China, you don't have very good doctors. Okay, therefore with AI, it gives you access or the quality of diagnostics are drastically improved. Therefore, they are much more willing than we are to give their, 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 their personal data. And, and so this is something you need to add. So the, the a clear to clearly articulate the benefit of AI versus the risk. And the last thing is really about the, 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 the social contract that the stakeholder, the, the, sorry, the company, your company can have with the different stakeholders. Okay, are, are you seen as accountable? Uh, is, is, is something that is really critical. For instance, this is one of the reasons why, among some others, uh, autonomous cars have difficulties to take off. Because who is accountable? Can I really trust a car manufacturer to, to drive something? What would happen with cybersecurity um, if we were hacked and uh, accidents were, 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 were created? So, so I think that you need all of that if you really want to have this social license to operate AI and to really leverage the full potential, uh, to unlock the full potential of AI. Thank you. Uh, that's, um, that, that's very interesting. That's very helpful. So uh, I would like to come back to the questions about uh, traditional industries using the AI. Yet again, you have mentioned it already a bit about um, uh, you said this transformers, yes, coming in and helping them to adapt. So perhaps tell us more about it, because of course that is very important for uh, for companies that are established in order for them to survive. Yes, but I, I think that these transformers, for instance, exist in China, in Europe or in the US, and coming back, in China, as I said, let, let's spend maybe three minutes explaining the differences we have into these uh, three regions. And maybe we can touch a bit about Africa, which is very dear to my heart. Um, so in China, what you have is you have, let's say, governments trying to make sure that the ecosystem of universities, um, tech giants, transformers who are leveraging tech giants, uh, let's say, um, technologies, but adapting them to a specific industry. Uh, and then uh, traditional companies are trying to work together to have, make sure that everyone is using AI as much as they can. So this is one type of work. In the US, it's very different. In the US, what you have is traditional companies have difficulties to transform, but are, but are let's say, replaced by, let's say, uh, tech companies entering into their industries. And this, this is what you see and uh, you've seen on retails or Netflix versus uh, uh, Blockbuster. So we have all the traditional ways of the, the, the Schumpeterian, uh, let's say, uh, creative destruction cycle that we see and that works pretty well in the US. In Europe, we do something a bit different and I'm not sure to be frank that it will work which is to say, okay, we don't have tech giants, we might not have transformers, and we have traditional companies trying to create 
in a sense, construction, to share some data, to make it happen and to transform themselves in-house. I think it will be, that one will be very, very difficult. And to be frank, it's still possible if they found, find their transformers, if they are really acting quickly, it's already gone on the B2C front. Basically, uh, uh, I don't believe that any uh, European tech giant will emerge. Um, we still have some opportunities in B2B because we, are, we know industry very well and we still have global leaders in terms of industries, but if they are not able to transform and to bring AI at the core of their business process, their, their processes and to reinvent their business model, I fear they will be, they will be overwhelmed. So, uh, so, so this is why it's very important for traditional companies to first understand what they can do with AI and the, 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 uh, the, the out of the possible with AI. It's very important to try to make sure that they rethink and therefore they rethink their business model and their operating model. And it is not just a question of subsidies or money. And then to find, let's say, companies that they could work with and that could help them emerge and rethink and, and, and implement it. So I think it's very, very important, especially for European companies to find the, the, uh, these, uh, let's say, uh, tech, uh, tech partners. And, and, and I was saying that what we see in the, in the um, in China as well with these transformers is the emergence of vertical specific ecosystems. Because I would say that AI technology might become a bit of a commodity and, and you will have specific, um, uh, let's say uh, specific uh, ecosystems coming because if I take for instance, uh, image recognition, uh, when you look at MRI, uh, basically you need to work on contrast. When you try to work on uh, image recognition for autonomous cars, it's about speed and colors. So at the end, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the algos will get trained on different elements and be much more specialized. So this is why I believe that we will have very soon more uh, vertical specific ecosystems or AI verticals AI vertical ecosystems. And these, the transformers I was mentioning in China might play a critical role there. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, now I wanted to come back to the point about um, different countries competing with each other. So uh, perhaps explain it to those who do not know much about this, um, um, what, are, what are the stakes um, and how do they actually compete? Yeah, so as I said, so there, there are several things and it's a way to think about regulation um, first. As, as I said, we will come with regulation with an S and, um, and uh, we can see that there is fragmentation by usage. Uh, for instance, in the EU, we have uh, something which is related to the estimated level of risk and you have, uh, let's say, uh, an acceptable risk, for instance, for social credit systems. There are questions uh, about, uh, let's say, uh, face recognition. Uh, you have low risk for chatbots. So you have this fragmentation. You have a second fragmentation, which will be more about by geography. Uh, we will see what uh, will happen in the US. You can see the new uh, uh, regulations coming in China as well to make sure that data will stay in China and there is no data what, which are transferred to, uh, to the US. It's a little bit the same in Europe as well. Uh, you have, uh, let's say, uh, the SREM2 uh, uh, stuff which was said and, uh, and uh, where you cannot send data from uh, Europe to the US or it's it becoming more complex. You still can, but, uh, but it's more complex. Uh, there will be fragmentation by companies. So we are working in a very fragmented world um, which will have implications for uh, companies because where should you play? Uh, how much can I train my uh, algo with data or should I have different, different ways of thinking? Which role, which are the new roles on organizational capabilities? Uh, how will I hire talents and so on? So I think that there are plenty of questions and in a sense, 
um, it's not just for AI, but you could say that we used to think as in a in a united world in a glo for global companies, and global companies might have to be back to multinational companies, uh, meaning that each country uh, they will have maybe to operate more autonomously in different countries. And so it's a massive change. And when you were discussing about uh, the um, what could happen for uh, for countries, what's at stake is the stake of it's a question of competitiveness of, of the nations, um, which is at stake. And and uh, as I told you uh, earlier on with this um, Russian friend, uh, considering that we should think about nuclear weapons, but I think it's even worse than that, because nuclear weapons, basically, we were just collecting uh, nuclear rockets and so on and parking them, storing them somewhere. Uh, but here, with AI, you can have direct impact on, as I said, election processes, uh, habits, information, and so on, fake news, all of that. So it can have a very important impact on each other in, in our society. And I fear that uh, we move to something which is uh, from uh, what we call the that you, you know cyber is uh, the, the, the negative face of uh, digital. I fear that we move more towards uh, towards cyber uh, more than uh, than to uh, to digital and cyber cyber security will become a massive element, especially if you think about um, if you think about uh, digital, if you think about quantum computing and what could uh, could happen. Mm -hmm. Okay, so and um, maybe um, coming back yet again to the trust element and so on and um, implementation of AI strategies. So you have also written a, uh, an article that um, talks about AI company needing to sort of engage all stakeholders and develop trust in order to actually implement AI strategies. So would you like to talk about this? And yeah, so I, I think it's a little bit what I mentioned when I talked about the social license, which is a trust, but it's important to really work with everyone on this. So you need to work with the, your customers, with your employees, with your population, with the entire population, with the government, with your shareholders. So you need to have an extensive stakeholder uh, approach and, and this is where companies and, um, and, and governments will need to work together. I would say on different fronts. One is really to um, make sure that you, um, you work with, um, you educate people on what AI is, what it is and what it is not. And for instance, Finland and Nordic countries have made, and Balt countries have made huge progress on that compared to, uh, to other countries, especially in Europe. Um, where they, 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 they train, they have MOOCs uh, to uh, make sure that people can get trained and understand what AI is. And it's very positive, not only because it reduces the fear uh, of AI, and at the same time, it makes employees much more knowledgeable about what they can do with AI. So I think it's very positive. So this is one part of it. The second part of it is the fact that we need to recognize that we don't know what the job tomorrow's jobs will be. So, and especially here, I talk more to Europeans, is the fact that the way we are when we enter into a job, jobs are clearly defined. And uh, if you want to move, let's say a job description, you need to almost go to, um, to, uh, to trial, or at least it's complex to do it. We need to change this mindset and to explain to people that they will get, need to get trained and upskill all along their lives. Um, and, and so I think that the way we think and we, um, we explain it is very, very important. Um, so we need to upskill our CXOs, we need to upskill our workers and make them understand that they will need to upskill uh, all lifelong. We need to uh, work with governments, we need to, and, and, and to understand that let's say the, 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 the borders of, uh, let's say, of a company are blurring and that we won't work anymore in a company, we'll be part of an ecosystem is something very important. Maybe one more point uh, on that and the, the need for everyone to create trust to, to work together. I would like to come back to um, maybe to Africa. 
because I think that with AI, we need to make sure that developing countries are not left behind because countries, emerging countries might lose on many fronts. So they might lose on the fact that um, a significant part of jobs uh, which are not extremely qualified will be done by AI. Uh, many jobs of qualified people will be done by AI as well. So I don't want you to think that it's not, it's just for blue colors. It's mostly, I would say for white colors, but many things can be get become uh, automated on one hand. And on the other hand, they might lose the ability to, uh, to work uh, together, um, they, they, they might lose uh, because AI will become, will accelerate and you will have an exponential curve on, uh, on adoption and on impact and on data created and so on. And, and this is why I think it's very important for companies, for countries with their giants to work with their giants to make them start the uh, virtual circle by consuming AI by making sure that they work with universities to create talents, to retain them, and to attract, as I was saying earlier on, to attract uh, tech companies to come to these countries and support the development of AI in Africa and in Latin America. Uh, otherwise, I fear that we'll have a, a two speed that, let's say, the, the, the AI divide is greater than the and larger than the digital divide that was even uh, larger than uh, the, uh, the the manufacturing divide that we used to have. And may have maybe perhaps I asked the last question, we have um, a couple of more minutes left. Um, the, in terms of policy, what are the policy makers, the governments should really um, think about when, um, when sort of um, making sure that they are competing in the AI um, domain well? So it's very difficult, and we are actually working together with OECD at some at the moment uh, to identify the policy that are the right ones, um, and we'll have a report probably issued in uh, let's say in June uh, 2022. This is at least what I uh, we are currently planning. But I I think that one of the issues we face with AI and policies is the fact that it's going extremely fast. AI is going extremely fast. So what do you do? And you cannot work with, without companies doing AI and they don't even know what will really happen. So, so I think that it's a very tricky, uh, tricky perspective, um, but, uh, but it's important to work on that. And uh, maybe it will be the opportunity to have a new uh, podcast with you. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Franco. Thank you very much for taking the time to talk to me. And um, it was truly insightful uh, to talk to you. So thank you very much and have a nice day. Thank you so much. Thank you, Annabelle. Thank you. Bye. Bye.